Good evening, good evening, and welcome, welcome to another week of analog television, and another week where the Spanish outnumber the English uh, two to one.、Um, yes, it is only a matter of time before we start calling this television and analogico. Television、yes. analogica. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There we go. Brilliant. Welcome,、yeah. <laughs> welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, and massive welcome to Nico. Nico, who is of course famous from YouTube already, and has a much more professional setup、um, and things like、yeah. two camera systems that he is going to be、mm-hmm. showing off, which is good. Marina, do you have two camera systems? Yes. Look, one this angle <laughs> and the other one. Perfect. That、Here. is very professional as well.、Um, so, yeah. so today, of course, we are going to be talking to Nico a little bit about、um, what he's been up to,、um, how he started his channel, and everything like that. And Marina is going to be asking lots of questions there. And then, of course, we're going to spend、uh, the majority of today, hopefully, on large format.、Um, people have been asking a lot of questions about large format. We know there's a lot of really cool companies doing a lot of great stuff at the moment.、Mm. Nico is a large format expert. I'm going to say that right here, right now. He has also taught a lot of people large format, so he's the perfect man to know what the common questions are and hopefully know what the common answers are, even better. And before we dive in, we just want to wish the best of luck to Jordan, who we can see in the comments is bidding <laughs> on a camera. If you want to annoy him, go on eBay and search for a six four five N with three lenses. I'm going to do it right now, <laughs> Jordan. I'm going to get your camera before you. But、uh, you're just saying, Nika, you've just been cheating with the six four five N, have you? Yeah, I've been on holidays or working holidays in Finland using the six four five N, so it's been really, really, really fun. So I recommend it. So bid higher if you can. <laughs> We're very sorry, Jordan, for ruining your evening. All right then, Marina. <laughs> over to you. What have you got for our、uh, esteemed guest? Yes,、guests? excellent. So, well, so again, thank you so much,、uh, Nico, for being here. I mean, for me, it's a pleasure to have another person from the Spanish analog panorama. And well, thank you so much for you know accepting my invitation. But、uh, I guess that well, many people know about you, but. For those who don't know you, we, I just wanted to you to do like a little a little introduction of yourself, like who is Nicolas Yesera, and、um, yeah. So, how did you start into film photography? Just a little bit about your background, basically. Yeah,、uh, I started. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Marina.、Uh, no worries. Know, I was going to say to Paul <laughs> that I'm half English, half Spanish, so we're exactly in the middle with three people.、Um, <laughs> Then、True. large, large、uh, photography. Probably thirteen, fourteen year old skateboarder Nico got into it.、Um, I think like a lot of people did, and then I just continued shooting film till film was too expensive、uh, mm. back in the day. And then I dropped out of photography again. Did a lot of you know the usual teenager stuff, and then got back into it when I I would say I sort of lost my job. And I、okay. bought a new camera and started shooting again, and then hooked up onto film, and haven't stopped since. And as you can see now, I have all this extra clutter、uh, surrounding me always. I see. So you started with、uh, with. So you were skating, right? Yeah. I see. So yeah, I I see a lot of people who start in like film photography because of skating. Is that? What do you think that is related? Like film photography equals, or is that related to、uh, skating? Well, there's skateboarding's never been like a big sport, like you know the popular sports.、Mm-hmm. Like you don't see it on TV usually, and you don't see it. And、mm-hmm. the culture was a lot magazine wise, and、mm-hmm. magazines it was all photography, and the photographers there were into arts. It wasn't just you know skateboarding. It was music. It was painting. It was collages. Yeah, yeah. It was true. And photography was the thing that I liked. So I always loved the photography issues that they used to do once a year, and <laughs> that's where I got into. And the only way to actually you know recreate photography, I mean skateboarding, was photography or video. And video back then、yeah. was really expensive. So nobody was doing video on phones or video on anything. So it was、no. photography was the only way. <laughs> I see. And、um, are you still, by any chance, shooting like film, but it related to skating by any chance? Or I have a couple. No, not really. I'm not in the scene anymore. But I do、oh. have a lot of good friends that have turned、mm-hmm. professional over the years, and 
I keep contact. I do want to have a couple episodes that I shoot mm -hmm. skateboarding with very different setups that people would never use probably. So <laughs> something will, I'll, I'll mix it at some point, but not right now. Okay, I see. And yeah, tell us a little bit about, I mean, yourself as a photographer and also as a content producer, like creator as well, because you've been doing a lot of things like such as workshops or even you have uh, two YouTube channels, which is quite a lot. So just tell us a bit what you're doing now related to analog photography. I mean, well, obviously taking yeah. pictures, but, but from that... <laughs> Well, actually, probably taking less pictures than ever. Uh, once you oh. start making video, you lose a lot of time. And anyone yeah, that's yeah. tried making videos would understand. But photography-wise, I yeah, I teach workshops mostly because a lot of people don't get to learn anymore. There's no store mm -hmm. at your local neighborhood where you can learn. Most like clubs are done or shooting HDR or, you know, I'm not saying it's only HDR, but, you know, they're doing other stuff. So when I found out that people wanted to learn, I... I rented this space that I'm in right now, and it looks like a kitchen because it's a fake kitchen. <laughs> uh, but basically, I opened the doors to everyone that wants to learn. And when I started back in film, I had a lot of people helping me. And thanks to that, it kind of turned me into wanting to give more to people. So I started the YouTube channel to try to show other stuff. And things in the YouTube realm were quite calm when I started. There was a couple of people yeah. doing some stuff, um, but there was not a lot. So I wanted to show more than the popular three cameras everyone talks about. And that's when I started doing YouTube. And then Spanish YouTube just became uh, a thing that I was like, okay, people in Spain doing content, but maybe I can do more. And as I already had an audience in the English channel, it was just kind of like, why not do it? I already have yeah. all the setup and equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, true, yeah. And, but um, when did you start it? Was it like long time ago or was uh, YouTube, it four years ago? Yeah, YouTube, YouTube was. I think five years ago. I might be wrong, but I think it was five years ago. You can I check see. my first video; is terrible. So <laughs> I, I don't, well, I don't I mean, erase, I don't erase content. So everything is there to show how good, good or bad it was since the beginning. Obviously, for your record and for everyone's record as well, like reference, like everyone like starts with whatever you have around. So yeah, I think yeah. it's a good thing to keep your your videos. But um, one of the things I, I re I'm really curious to know about is that how has been your journey in terms of like doing d videos for YouTube has been like straightforward or has been, you know, sometimes people say that it's like a wave or like in terms I, of like, I don't know. Well, to me, it's been more of a tsunami in the, <laughs> I, I, I like learning stuff I don't know about. So I think film to me was very interesting from the beginning because, you know, everything's new, uh, medium format, then large format, then ultra large format, then color printing or whatever. So when I got into video, I had no clue. I thought it was as simple as pointing a little point and shoot and clicking go and it would look great. So I got very into that and it's been really good. I really love making videos. I enjoy talking to people. I really, really enjoy hearing people that like mm -hmm. now in the comments are saying, oh, Nico helped me find a Hazabot or... Nico helped me this, so I always try to answer all my comments. It's been, I've answered every comment till around six to nine months ago, and now I just can't keep up. Of course. So yeah. I, I try to do this as my YouTube channel is, yeah, it's Nico's Photography Show, but it's only there because people watch it, and I would only keep on doing it. People enjoy it. If, if not, I, I'd rather take pictures. I'd rather do other stuff, but I really like sure. that. So the more I do, the more I like it. And then I do more. So I've been, I posted like 550 something videos in five years. So like a hundred a year, uh, which is <laughs> comes, to a, comes to around two videos a week on average. Wow. That's, that's, and how did you find out like all the, how did you find all the, 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 the time to do all the videos? Like, and well, first of all, the ideas and then the time to do it and then uh, recording, editing, how two videos per week. That's insane. Um, wow. basically, basic, I have a full-time job, which is a lot of people don't understand that I do. Um, so yeah, I find well. the time by never stopping. I don't have any other hobby. I'm not a drinker or, you know, I don't do bicycle riding or any other thing yeah. like that. So to me, it's, I get out of work and I have a very boring work and I'll air quote it boring <laughs> because I got to pay attention, but I can think. 
So yeah. I spend my day with a notebook writing ideas all the time. So I probably, I would say I have enough content already prepared in notes for maybe another 10, 15 years if I do the videos. No at this way. Whoa, that's such a brave thing to say. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I have a lot of things to say, baby. So, <laughs> well, yeah. that's really great. But so um, is there, w would you say that is there, what is the best thing that you would say that you got out from doing videos on YouTube? The best and the worst, or like the least that you, li that you like? Um, the best is people, basically. I've met people around the world. Mm. I, I can say that even though a lot of people I haven't met in person, they consider them my friends. I would fly mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. And it, this has happened before where I've missed the flight connection in the middle of nowhere. And no I can way. I can like write someone and have dinner with them, picking me up at the airport. So the community has been the best. Um, mm -hmm. So that's great. Like it, you, you don't feel alone because film photography nowadays is not something you can do usually around your town. At least yeah. I can't. So or I have a couple of friends, but not that many. But like the whole world community is amazing. And people have come from everywhere to visit me. I've had uh, a, one of my viewers came from Vietnam just to see me for a weekend. Uh, so wow. stuff like that's been super, super amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and then the worst part, I would say, you take less pictures, but it's not too bad. Yeah. I I only take pictures of my personal life, so my family, wherever <laughs> I go and stuff. I don't shoot street photography. I don't do portraits of strangers. I don't do any of that. So I take less pictures, and it's taken a, quite a lot of time away from my family and my children, but. I get enough time. I divide my time pretty efficiently. So that's probably the worst is the amount of time it takes, but I can't complain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, would you have any advice for someone who wants to start into like YouTube doing videos uh, about, well, my, photog well, photography, yeah. for example, I think photography. Yeah. I mean, if you, if someone wants to start into film YouTube, I would say you, you do it if you love it but you have to really 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 love it it's not one of those things that oh yeah it's kind of a fling and it's fine if it's a fling you can do it i i don't think there's a commitment to stay if you don't yeah, like yeah, it you yeah. move and actually i named my channel nico's photography show because it's my photography so if i decide tomorrow that i want to sell everything and buy i don't know a phone yeah. and shoot phone photography that would be it <laughs> so it's not going to be the passion for film or nico shoots film um I would say you got to love it. you got to really, really, really love it. It's got to be one of those things that you can talk to your mother, to your wife or girlfriend <laughs> or boyfriend. or like If you're that involved, then fine. It's going to be really yeah. fun. If not, you're going to burn out somehow at some point. And everybody burns out, but like at a different level. Yeah, yeah. Especially because, you know, it's like, uh, well, yeah, it's really, you have to um, be, as you said, like very committed to it. Like, because uh, it's, yeah, you consume a lot of hours, efforts and everything. But if you do it because you love it, then it's great. And then, you know, the feedback yeah. that you get from people, which is the thing that I wanted to say, because uh, I think that people who are watching us and even including myself, you being like a really good resource for us, like really help for us in terms of like even like shooting uh, with any ca well, like, well, many cameras, I would say, like you've been a help really get help for us and I just wanted to first say thank to you Nico honestly like you. you've been a great great like father for us and I think that many people will agree with me that yes yeah, so you've just been like such a great help for us and inspiration as well and um one of the things one of I was the, gonna yeah, I was, sorry, sorry. Man, if I just jump in so I, I definitely echo all of that um, and I think mm. when we announced that, that Nico was going to be on here, there was a lot of spontaneous love for uh, people and people reminiscing about the video mm. that they remember most or they, they, they learned the most as well. Um, mm. And actually, while you, were, while you were talking, Nico, I did share a bit about your, uh, of your English channel and I'll flip back to it now because what I've always been really impressed by is not just the video content, but the way you curate it. You have your mm. playlists, you have your clear ideas. And this is where I think I really it's incredible that like you have a buying guide that speaks you know specifically to that you had i think you did a whole series which just showing people how to load specific cameras for a while yes um which is yeah. which is amazing yeah. and again it's one of those resources it seems silly but one of the things i get a lot of at the moment is uh, at the shop is people phoning up asking how to load it the first time or 
unload it and reload the net. You know, these right. things are basic and, and be able to say, look, it's very hard to talk someone through that over the phone. Here's a video, yeah. you know, go. How do you plan which playlist gets the love at any one point? Is it like, you say you've got that 10, 15 years of notes. Is that like, yeah. there isn't enough on the internet about this thing or people are asking about this thing or is it? I mean, I like the film loading videos that you're mentioning, like I get it. Like I, I know it's, let's say it's beginner's content and I don't want to say a curse word because I don't think anybody should be cursed because they don't know. So I call mm -hmm. it like the, I, you don't know what you're doing kind of content. Mm -hmm. And that stuff, I, <laughs> there's never, like you, nobody's born knowing and nobody can ask anyone nowadays. Like I said, you don't mm -hmm. have a camera store. Yeah, yeah. If, you buy, if you buy a Contax T2 that's $1,000 because you saw your favorite creator with it and you don't know how to load it, you shouldn't feel insulted to be asking on a forum. No. So you can Google that. I have a video, you watch it. You can say thank you if you feel like it. If not, you go to the next thing. So I think there's no small content out there that shouldn't be done. And I understand people that don't want to do it. It's absolutely fine. I do it. I love it. And actually is probably one of my biggest revenue streams is the loading cameras because everybody watches it. Um, but Good. yeah, and yeah. how do I curate my content? Like I love the playlist idea. I wish people could subscribe only to playlists mm. because I think that would be super fun. Um, but you can't. YouTube doesn't let you do that. So oh. I do a little bit of different things about the years of content. It's sometimes just blending ideas that are like, this is interesting and this other thing is interesting. What if I throw them together and make a series? Mm -hmm. So basically it's just mixing and doing little things that could work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You did say that you were growing your hair specially for one series at the yeah. moment, Point Live. Yeah, I've been, this year I wanted to do a video a, a month where I recreated uh, famous self-portraits. And I say self-portraits because they're not all like that, but most of them would be. And uh, I did one about Nicholas Nixon that I uploaded like three months ago. And the next one's going to be Avedon. So I don't have Avedon's hair or Avedon's material. <laughs> so what I'm doing is trying to grow it long enough that I can shape it in some way of form to shoot like <laughs> Avedon. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and the idea by that is that I replicate the same camera, same lens, same lighting, yeah. oh, wow. same okay. developing, so people can understand because yeah, you can look at Avedon's work and think that's amazing, mm. whatever, I want to replicate, but like trying to understand, and I have so many tools that I could shoot, although I have 12 or more portraits figured out and I have all the gear that I need. So super wide angle cameras, special cameras, Leica cameras, whatever it is, I have it. So that's the idea. It's brilliant. I mean, oh. I've been growing my hair on and off for the last six months, but only because of COVID, whereas you've got a, you've yeah. got a reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I cut my own hair, so that's how I save money uh. for film, basically. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry, Marina, that was me jumping in. I'll, I'll jump uh, back out. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I was, uh, guess, uh, um, yeah, well, um, you know, as I said, before, I was saying before that you've been like really great source in terms of like helping out like with lot of things related to film photography but uh, one of the things that you've been like really helpful was uh, um, you know teaching about large uh, format photography large format cameras which I think I can say that uh, you are one of the well we are one of the only ones who really does the the explanation of everything in such a great detail when you're talking about large format cameras and um, yeah, so um, what, what was that? Was that the reason that you started to do these these videos? Because you saw that there's not that much content related to that large format photography, and you wanted to do it, or it was because you had first a passion to for an, uh, sorry large format photography, and then you said, okay, I'm gonna do this, or how how no, was it? No, I I started in general. I already shot large format actually probably the first large format shooter that started again is Matt Mirage which is there uh he was the yes. one that started off and I learned a lot from him and he posted probably like I don't know 10 12 videos tops and then he stopped for years and came back now like just recently so to me it was I shot everything I shot 35 and medium format and large format and the content just came into large format because I saw there wasn't so much in you know the recent years Yes. And I decided I could show, you know, different things. And there's a lot of videos that I've done. There's a lot more I want to do. And actually, Matt is probably doing exactly what I would have done if I was going to start fresh again. So, like, 
I want to do like the one-on-one -on, -one on how to load or what different formats or lenses or shutters or everything like that. So there's more to come, but I think large format is right. one of those fields of photography that is not a standard. So it's not so simple to get into. No. Yeah, you're right. And um, now, well, I would love to talk about your experience in, when, well, in terms of large uh, format photography. So do you think is that a myth that is super difficult to get into and is super expensive to get into large format photography or what, uh, what is your experience? Um, I think, I mean, expensive, I would say it's just as expensive as buying one Leica camera body <laughs> or one Leica lens. So expensive yeah. is a relative term. Even like nowadays people say, oh, a Hazaba is expensive, but then they buy an iPhone for $1,500. So it's a yeah, relative thing. True. Like you can you can get a large format camera, and one lens and a holder and film and a tripod for less than five hundred dollars or euros if you want to. The uh, thing is, uh, if you want to get like a lot of the nice stuff, it is sort of expensive, but it's nothing compared to the rest of the formats. To me, I think it's probably still pretty much the cheapest format in terms of gear. Uh, uh -huh. I think the expensive part is uh, per shot. I would say. <laughs> so every time you take a shot, True. it's more money because there's more surface of film exposed. So um, yeah. basically, that's how it goes. But um, do you think that is really like difficult to get into? Like, for example, in my case, I'm a I would say I'm a completely beginner into large format photography. And I don't know, in my case, I think it's a little bit intimidating and confusing in terms of what gear should I get? Like what parts I should I get? How? what are the things I need to look for? Like, because I mean, even for example, th when people buy 35 mil cameras and they don't know that much about uh, film photography, they don't know what are the things I need to check. So yeah. is there I've... any advice for complete beginners? Because Paul, yeah. you are, Paul is a beginner as well, so we are too. <laughs> well, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, when we start the large, large format conversation properly, I should show my hand off. I did back um, Ethan's camera dactyl. Um, and it was 20% because I want to try a large format and 80% because I got sucked in by the, uh, <laughs> the look of the camera that he was going for. And I ended up yeah. with uh, an incredible piece of kit that I have never shot, um, never got as far as getting a, a lens for it. Um, yeah. Admittedly, I did get it just before I moved from Geneva, which um, was tough on a priorities mm -hmm. of life kind of thing. But... That's my position. So before we go into it, Marina, have you owned any large format cameras, shot any large format? Uh, I've never owned a large format camera, but I shot twice. So when I was studying film, for, film photography, I, we went to a photo camp. We went with a lot of like equipment and one of the things were a large format camera and we were taking Polaroids with a large format camera. But Mm. That was just my own experience. I don't remember. I think it was like, has been six years from that. Actually, in fairness, so, the only other experience I have is, of course, the very first analog television episode ever was Graham I, taking yes. a photo <laughs> of me on large format. So I've been on the <laughs> receiving end, but never the shooter. So there we go, Nico. That's, <laughs> that's a summary of <laughs> the people who yes. are on this show with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, we're completely new ways. <laughs> no, large, so. large format, I think... To start, like Marina was saying, how do you start? How do you know? Um, the thing is that, that there's no standard like a Nikon mount and Nikon lenses or Canon mount and Canon lenses or, you know, 35 film just goes on 35 or medium format. So that idea that everything kind of works together, but sometimes it doesn't or lenses won't cover or wide angles too wide. So maybe it doesn't work on your camera. That's the weird thing there. And as it always was pretty much the very, very, very high-end professional gear, it's mm -hmm. not so easy to start learning. But honestly, like lenses, like a lot of people ask, oh, what's the normal lens? It's as simple as four by five. The lenses is times three. So full frame times three. So a 50 mil on 35 is a 150 in four by five. So you just have to do, multiply it by three. And then if you're doing it by 10, by six. So that oh, kind of okay. like I I don't even think about lenses in terms of full frame anymore. To me, it's just mm -hmm. every system's different. So you tell me normal lens eight by ten is a three hundred. 
normal lens on an 11 by 14, like the one I have back there, is around yeah. 420 to 450. So like it's not so hard once you get into it, but it's a little hard to start. And I have to admit it is like a little daunting, but I think nowadays in 2020, there's Intrepid with amazing content about lenses and lens guides. Okay. There's people like uh -huh. Ben Horn, there's videos from me, there's videos from Matt <laughs> Mirage. So like you just have to sit down and watch a little more than if you want to buy a Pentax K1000 basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, will, is there any like kits or like any camera lens that you will uh, like recommend to someone who wants to start? Like even for myself, because I want to, I, I really want to start as well, like format photography. And I, but I'm not sure what should I do. <laughs> I I think oh. the best recommendation, I th even though it might not be the best in terms of long end, like buying it and keeping it for years is for example a monorail camera so monorail cameras have a rail in the middle and then okay. the bellows and the front center and the back center just move freely through the the rail so those are really 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 cheap and they're also really really bulky and heavy but bulky and heavy make it easier to use most of the time so you can start at home you can buy a four by five monorail for usually sometimes even a hundred less than a hundred pounds or euros or dollars um, and then you can start at home shooting still photography of a plant yeah, yeah, yeah. or a sculpture or, you know, another camera. And that's a great way to start. So I would recommend a monorail as a great start. And I had made a video that was like, uh, why monorails are the best to start. I think I said something oh, like nice. that. And, I should uh, watch that out then. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then like a normal lens, like I said, is a 150, 135 millimeter. So get something like that. Um, Usually don't go for the cheapest version you see because usually the shutters might be faulty. Yeah. Buy with a warranty, of course. Try to get something that mm. you can return if it's not working. And then start with 4x5, which is a film holder like this one. Yeah. And buy the cheapest black and white film you can buy from Anal <laughs> so Analog Wonderland. Or, band, right? <laughs> yeah. In Europe, I would say Fomapan 100 comes to around like 50 to a euro ish per shot so that's extremely easy to shoot mm -hmm. and uh yeah. then j just start shooting i mean you need a lens a camera a heavy tripod that can hold your camera and then yes. you just need to start and then having like the discipline the, another thing that scares people with large format is there's not such a thing as automatic settings that tell you what you're doing no. so you don't know if your your dark side is on or off you don't know if your lens is cocked or not. So you have yeah. to kind of follow some steps, but it's very simple when you do it. I highly recommend usually to start with no film, just like try to shoot something <laughs> without shooting. See I if see. you know how, how you do it. And then if you know, then you can start doing film, but do cheap film. Don't start. A lot of people start with like yeah. portrait film because that's what they saw their favorite YouTuber shooting. Yeah. This stuff is, this stuff should be when you're like a master of large format. Or yeah. sort of master. Let's say <laughs> you you mastered the mistakes, and then you can start. Yeah. yeah. And what now that I'm curious, what would it be uh, your your worst mistake when you're taking a photographs with large format cameras? Can you tell yeah. us that secret? Yeah. The worst mis the worst mistake <laughs> is double exposures. So oh. if you shoot properly, and by accident you shoot again properly on the same sheet of film you've missed two great pictures. So uh, the thing I do with my film holders is usually there's a black side and a white side and black okay. me, me usually means used and white means not used. Don't uh -huh. ask me if that's the, the right way. That's how I do it. Some people do it the other way around. Just keep the same code. Um, if I have, a, like I've shot two shots, but I have two holders that are not sure, I will mm -hmm. not use those holders anymore and I'll develop film even if it's not shot because I'll screw a film but I won't lose the shot so that's okay. how I do it so it's like if you take a shot with a Hasselblad you're not sure if you took it do you retake it or you just pass to the next frame and you're like if there's nothing there I lost the frame but if I take two pictures on top of each other then you've screwed yeah. up Un uh, unless you really like experimental photography like Carlos <laughs> I was about to say you asked Carlos and he'd be like why only two <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, it, the problem is if you're not looking for it, that's usually when you get kind of a little upset. Mm.
Hmm. And uh, for example, let's say that you tomorrow you're gonna shoot uh, some large format films. Um, so how many holders would you take with you? How did you prepare when you go outside and you want to take photographs um, with the large format camera? I think that it's that's a quite personal thing in terms of each person shoots like yeah. differently. But if you leave with a large format camera and you're beginning, if you shoot more than four to six shots, you've done a great day, like <laughs> amazing day. So I take usually maybe four film holders, which mean eight shots because each film holder has two sides. Hmm. So I'd say four, five tops maybe. And that's yeah. about it. And and they're heavy. So you're carrying like three of these are pretty big. And then, mm. I mean, it's expensive too. So you don't want to shoot. Like I usually shoot things before in medium format or I've gone to mm. the place and I've seen it. I like the scene. I know when I want to go with the lighting. It's not so much of a shoot mm. and like, uh, what is it? Spray yeah, and pray. Yeah, yeah. Unless yeah. you really like that, like the camera dactyl, uh, Paul was mentioning, like I have the OG, <laughs> it's up there in a box, which I actually set up with Ethan here in my studio um, because he came to nice. visit. And mm. uh, that camera is a point and shoot. Mm. So like I've shot with a travel wide, which is the previous version of that from a, diff a different brand. Uh -huh. And that, with that camera, I've shot up to 30 to 40 shots uh, in an afternoon. But because that was like just fun. It was just shooting, mm. shooting, shooting. But it's not mm -hmm. the... It's not the normal thing to do. As about I was, it's a great point. I think because um, I think when I when I shoot medium format versus thirty five mil, I I on a smaller scale, but I don't. Hmm. I I definitely feel freer with a one ten or a thirty five mil camera, and then medium format, I do feel like um, much more inclined to wait and to plan. So with large format, especially when you're talking about setting up a tripod, you're not going to go on a city walk and be like, hey, maybe I'll find something that's worth setting up yeah mm -hmm. and and the stuff is heavy so you're walking with a tripod that usually you bought for cheap so it's not the carbon fiber fantastic stuff uh you're <laughs> walk, walking with an aluminum thing with a very heavy head you're walking with uh maybe you got a field camera but you maybe you have a like a monorail a monorail can be seven to twelve kilos so just get a the idea Oops, of that <laughs> uh and then <laughs> Setting up and breaking down takes around 10 to 15 minutes when you're new. Uh, it may be even more. So, like, you're not shooting 20 pictures in an afternoon at all. Uh, can, I, can you imagine, like, you want to take a portrait with, like, a stranger that someone is passing yeah. on the street, like, okay, just a scary moment. <laughs> there's, there's a video on YouTube that someone did, like, the, the fun joke of getting a model, sitting them on the bench and being like, let me go, and, like, starting... And the model's like looking at her watch and just like walks away before the guy hits the, uh, the <laughs> shutter. So it takes practice. Like I've had a project on 8x10 that I wanted to get really, really good at. And mm. the thing is I needed to shoot a lot of stuff. So what I did is I did, uh, I shot 100 portraits in one day on 8x10. Oh, wow. And what happened at the end is I could focus, compose, shoot, and everything in less than a minute. Um, and that was just because I wanted to get really, oh, really oh, good. Oh, less than a minute. Yeah. Yes. Um, but what was what was that at the start of the day? So you got it down to a minute. Was it three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, the first one, do you think? Uh, I mean, I had already been shooting uh, yeah. eight by ten for a while. But this was, mm -hmm. I did it at Revelate at the film festival ah, cool. in, yeah. in Barcelona. And uh, basically, it's just, you start doing one, then another one. And by the end of the day, I was like, okay, people got excited about it. So they were coming and waiting. And they're like, okay. Can I take a shot? I was like, yeah, come st stand in front. And I had the camera set up already. Yeah. So it wasn't like oh, setting it all up. I see. Wow. Matt, 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 Matt's actually commented, I think the other benefit is, you know, you say all that weight might be a bad thing, but actually it's a great workout. So yeah. fitness yeah. and photography combining, uh, combining perfectly. You actually said something um, to me and Marina before we started filming um, that I think was quite interesting. And yeah. in a world where, um, we're often guilty of chasing the latest camera. Um, what is your advice, not all the time, obviously, but to some people who come and ask you about starting large format? You're asking me or Marina, sorry? You. Nico. Oh, yeah. um, when you're starting, I think, like uh, we were talking about it, and it, for example, what Intrepid has done is amazing, opening the large format world to a lot of people that never thought about it. I think, when you're starting and you don't know what you're doing, you kind of need a little bit of help. And for that, 
the Intrepid sometimes is not ideal because it doesn't have maybe zeroing position or 90 degree uh, lock and stuff like that. So I always said, uh, when you want to start, try to get something that's slightly easier on the user. And then when you know what you're doing, like I have my Intrepid cameras because when I want to travel somewhere and I know the conditions are terrible, I take a camera like that because if it breaks, it's not going to break a thousand or two thousand euros worth of camera. Oh, it's yeah. going to it's sure. break 300, 400 pounds at tops. So that's what I usually recommend. It's something that's a little easier on the user. And I have a Chamonix here, which is a great camera, but it's a thousand. So maybe you don't want to start with that. So to me, always the Graflex has been the best option to start with something that's not a monorail, but is really simple to use. And they sell for around 300-ish, 400-ish. And they're 50-year-old okay. cameras, but you'd be surprised how well they usually are. Uh, in working conditions. So that's what I recommend is something that will help you. And then when you know what you're doing, get whatever you want. If you want a cheap camera that you can break, get a cheap camera. You want a super expensive camera because you do ar architecture, get it. But like at the mm -hmm. beginning, you want something that helps you. It's like recommending a, you know, Pentax K1000 is the student camera. It is because there's nothing else to do than the three things, you know, shutter, uh, shutter speed or aperture and the ISO and that's it or focusing yeah. at the most. Uh, so this is kind of the same thing, like getting a camera that can do more sometimes is worse. Mm. And, and also, and this is a leading question because I, uh, I know the answer you gave before. Um, do you always recommend that people who want to shoot large format try it? Uh, no, I usually encourage people to <laughs> maybe not go for it. And it's not in a negative way, like large format is amazing. And I was the first one that went heads in without knowing a thing about it. I bought a Graflex like, I don't know, nine years ago and I was like super excited. I took it on my honeymoon, whatever. It was oh. an experience. But I think large format can be quite daunting if you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, there's problems where you shoot or exposing or developing and stuff like that and you can burn out. And like I told you guys before, I compare it to kind of like owning a boat. Like you buy a boat, you really want to have a boat because it's going to be mm. expensive to maintain. It's going to be expensive to use or hard to use. You need a little extra know-how. So if you really, really, really want it, give yourself a couple weeks or months. And if you still really, really want it, then maybe get into it. And if you can, try to use someone else's for a little bit. Get a friend that has one to show you mm -hmm. all the stuff because it's yeah. it's really fun to use, but it is sometimes a little too much for some people. And they find out later down the road that they don't like it and they sell it and they make mistakes of losing money or, yeah. you know, getting film that expires because they don't shoot it that much because they found out that their wife or kids are like, I don't want to be in front of the camera for 15 minutes, dad. And they walk away. <laughs> so, so a large format is I recommend that you don't start when you want to give yourself a little bit more time and then start. Mm -hmm. No, I think and, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And what would it be the, the the best, well, the format that you feel more comfortable with, that you feel more like you prefer to shoot always with 4x5 or 8x10? Or what is the thing that makes you like, I want to shoot this in 8x10, I want to shoot that in 8 by, or 4x5 or even um, larger? Yeah, to me, the only reason I shoot a 4x5 is because it's cheaper. Uh, uh -uh. Everything about it, I don't really like it. Uh, oh. So the ground glass, I, I know it's large format. And guys, I'll turn around. Let me see. We said we had two angles. Let's see if the angle two works. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Like, a, a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bought a super expensive thing to just do that one change. But like basically this four <laughs> by five, it looks big. But when you get your loop, which is the little magnifier, yeah. and you go from corner to corner, it becomes quite small very fast. And that's kind of annoying. So, and then if you're doing architecture on a camera like this, the building is that big. So that's just think TV. of a whole building in there. And then you go to the top and you want to focus. So like to me, the, cho the choice in format is eight by 10. If I could shoot everything, it would be eight by 10. I have 11 by 14 behind. I love it, <clears throat> but that's a little too big, too heavy, and sometimes too annoying. So I would say eight by 10. And just so reference, this is eight Whoa. by 10. And this is four by five, uh, so it's four times bigger, um, but it's extremely that's... easy. And when you look at the ground glass on eight by 10, it's extremely comfortable to focus, to find precise focus, to do shame flung, to do mm -hmm. tilt shift or anything like that. So eight by 10 to me is 
the format if I could afford to shoot it back and day back and forth. And honestly, at, at the amount I shoot, I probably could, but I have a lot of four by five. And then you know sometimes I buy four by five or sometimes like that one. Intrepid sent me one to do a series, so like it's it, it becomes something that I have, but I would stay on eight by ten all day. Do you mind them um, actually? Yeah. One thing you said there, I think, is worth picking up on. Again, for people who don't know large format necessarily, you said tilt shift. And again, a lot of people today might know tilt shift from digital photography presets or filters <laughs> yeah. um, rather than the original. Are you, would you mind just quickly demonstrating maybe what that looks like in, uh, in the original term? Um, basically, Shift is shifting something. So shift, for example, on a large format camera. Let me see if I can do angle two and you guys can see oh, it. Hang on, hang on, but, oh. hang on, hang on. Ready? Hey! Hey! hey. <laughs> there we go. We've got kids somewhere. Sorry, I, I, I'm looking at the live stream. No, no, no. We just did the applause soundtrack again. It's... Oh, okay, sorry. okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, guys. So, so shift is basically shifting something vertical or horizontal in the same plane. So. If I move the lens up and down, that's shift up or down, or rise and fall. But that's basically moving two objects in the same uh, parallel uh, lines. When you shift, I mean, when you tilt, what you do is you move one forward. So for example, I'll try to see if you guys can see this. I'm going to have to do it off camera and then show you. And this is an extreme example. Uh, this is tilt, OK? Uh -huh. well, so <laughs> what you do is you move the lens forward. And this throws the focus instead of being parallel. And when I mean parallel is 35 millimeter of 120 uh, film, you're using a lens that's straight, a back that's straight, and then let's say a human person standing straight. That's the focus. Yeah. And depth of field works forward and backwards. When you tilt, that that depth of field suddenly is turned, like in this case, it's laying down. So it could be a rock in front of you and mountains very far mm -hmm. away. And yeah. then the depth of field goes up and down. It doesn't go forward and backward. Mm. So okay. always, like you said, Paul, people know this from, you know, the tilt shift effect on Instagram, sadly. Uh, what it does, it basically can keep one line focused if that's what you want and make people like little people or look like, you know, Legos. Or you can do it to ah. actually get your shot in focus, which is what it's usually <laughs> meant to be used. But people don't use it like that. People use it for, you know making some weird effect on Instagram. No, but exactly. It's a, it's, a fine, it's a fine tuning of the focal plane that is, you just don't have in 35mm or 120. Uh, yeah, or, or you have, imagine you're shooting, and you were mentioning before we started the live stream, a picture of my kids here in the studio with a camera all <laughs> twisted. Like, if you have a person that's a little bit in front of the other person, or you have someone with their eyes looking at camera but being off camera, uh, or looking out of camera, and you have an eye, let's say, at one meter, and the other eye at one point something meters. If you want to shoot wide open, you can, sh like, you can, like, tilt the lens, and then you can get both eyes wide open, and that's mm -hmm. the idea of it. So the idea is for correcting problems when you're shooting, but people have taking it. Yeah, that's the shot. People have taking it basically the other way around. Uh, and using it for other reasons of maybe making things out, out of focus on purpose. Also, you can use it creatively to make very interesting compositions and, you know, make a focus be exactly on one spot. You can use that on two angles and make only one spot focused, which is complicated, but it can be done. Uh, so, yeah, it's basically that's the concept. And then if you tilt the front, you don't change the shape of the object. If you tilt the back, you do. So that's due to the basically the light traveling further or not it's a little complicated to teach on a video while we live stream but so just to be just to be clear on this photo then of, of your daughters the reason that that front is tilted isn't just to make a very pretty uh snapshot no. composition <laughs> no, i actually took i actually took that picture and i shot them both at a body's difference and they're both in focus that's amazing and that again uh -huh. that's you could have the most expensive 120 camera in the world, but if it doesn't have the ability to do that, you can't shoot wide open and get those two people. No. Exactly. You would have to stop it down to f22 or 32, and then you might get the background in focus that you don't want or something mm -hmm. like it. So, there, so, uh, so maybe large format isn't just a bigger photo with more detail. There are also creative options. Oh. Sorry, Marina. Um, yeah. No, it's... Um, 
would you think do you do you think that large format camera actually helps to get a like bet, better pictures when you're taking like pictures about like buildings or architecture so what is the the main thing that large format cameras does for you i think to me it lets me create things that you can't see with your eyes because your eyes can't correct perspective yeah and your eyes can't focus on three things that are in different planes um, so it kind of plays some tricks like that. I think for architecture, there's nothing better. I think yeah. that what, what Paul was saying, if for, like large format is just not a bigger negative. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different tool that can be used. Of course, the bigger negative is fun and we all like bigger, you know, 120 <laughs> is so much better than 35 and four by five is so much better. So it can be fun to use as a bigger format. And of course the quality is gonna always blow your mind, but yeah. I feel, people misunderstand that it's just not a bigger format. It's so much more. And that's why the movements get involved. But of course, when you're starting, like start off by not doing anything else, but shooting straight. And then when you learn, start with maybe rise and fall. And then when you've learned that, maybe try like a little tilt and do something. And I, like I said, okay. like I told you at the beginning, do it at home, grab a table, focus on something in front of you and something a little further just by turning the lens down. And you'll be surprised how fun and easy it can be. What, what I've just started doing as well, Nico, as you're talking there, is actually start to show one of the videos from your channel, which I think is architecture um, yeah. in, uh, well, I, w I won't try and pronounce it. Le oh, I will. Le Grogno. Le Grogno. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So, so this is, this is a, a day that you spent shooting architecture um, on, looks like, 4 by 5 Yeah, 4 by 5 and, and what was your yeah, nice. thinking then of, of this camera and this setup for this project in particular? Well, first of all, I wanted to shoot color because I, I saw this building on a morning, I think like a Friday morning and Saturday morning we were there. So like I wanted to shoot it in color because it has that fluor kind of like, uh, like that green, you know, yeah. color. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was like, this has to be color. So like I said, four by five color each sheet. I don't know what the price is in Europe, but maybe five to seven euros and uh, or or pounds I, yeah. I i don't know currencies that well anymore um because i'm not buying film thankfully so <laughs> eight by ten is eight by ten is around maybe 20 to 30 euros a shot so <gasps> four four by five comes yeah. because of that and then then you got to develop it which becomes also pretty expensive if you don't do it yourself i do it myself but for those who don't it's really expensive and then the, another problem is lenses have to cover the format. So like I mentioned before, uh, all lenses fit sometimes, but they don't all cover. And when you do architecture, you need a big circle because you're moving the lens up, you're moving the lens down, and that uh -huh. circle has to cover the format. So eight by 10 lenses that cover big circles go from maybe instead of being 300 euros or 400 euros, they go into the 1,000 or 2,000 very fast. So yeah, so so basically, eight by ten would be the yeah. choice. Would be my choice, but like I said, I can't afford to shoot ten pictures in a video for YouTube. No. Uh, I can shoot four by five, but I cannot shoot eight by ten like if it was four and, by and five. And that, that again, I think, is another interesting thing that you don't have to worry about on a different um, different format is that the lens might not cover the photo that you're seeing. Um, we're just seeing, actually, you, you take the photos and load the film holder. You have that very uh, sexy scarf, the um, mobile <laughs> hood. Um, yeah. So for clarity, is that necessary for loading the film or is it something that helps you when you shoot? No, basically that's the dark cloth or is it helps you create that darkness so you can see the glass. Mm -hmm. Just like a Hasselblad, like when you pop up the, the view, fin, like the waist level finder, it's like a little chimney this does the same thing for your large format camera. So you're seeing a dark scene and then you see the ground glass and you can focus and you can accurately compose. So that's basically what you're trying to do when you're using that. It's the only way you can see it. Some cameras have like a little pop-up, little uh, waist level finder style and mm -hmm. it works really well, but some don't. And that's when you use the dark uh, cloth basically. Yeah, and we can see actually as you, as you, as you prepare um, one of the shots, you've got one of those little luggage holders with the foam in it you can see how much gear you're taking to carry around yeah um, wow. yeah project no yeah i i have a pelican case that basically ah. carries the minimum which is a camera two or three lenses like four or five film holders and then i have uh -huh. like 
for, uh, I think I have a light meter. I'm looking at it right now. A level and uh, a loop. And that's what I can carry there. And I only need a tripod. But on this trip, as I was shooting for YouTube, the idea with that video was that I, not only would I shoot pictures on normal film, but Polaroids too. So I need to take a Polaroid holder and I shot some black and white stuff and some color, I think. And those went on eBay to try to fund the video because like I said, it's it's not cheap. Like a video like this, I shot 10 shots of color. That hmm. comes to around 100 uh, euros in, in film. Plus driving, I took a camera guy, I took a drone operator. So hmm. when I do that, I try to be like, okay, well, let me oh. see if I can, I can do something. Uh, that can go, yeah. burn We've just the investment. the Polaroid, yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. That's good. And then the other thing that people who haven't seen someone shoot large format before might be surprised. So the shutter doesn't sit on the camera itself, right? No, the camera, the camera doesn't have the, the camera is an empty box. Honestly, it could be make out. You can make it out of cardboard. You can make it out of 3D printed like Ethan and other people are doing. But the lens is the one that covers the shutter. And it basically each lens has a specific shutter. They have to be different depending on the lens elements. So that's when it gets a little tricky when you're choosing because you've uh -huh. got to know a little bit more. So you know, need to know if it's a Copal 1 or Copal 3 or Copal 0 because depending on the camera you use, the format you want to use. So that's why when I talk to people through social media and they ask me, Nico, what lens should I buy? I always tell them like, just write me which lens you want to buy and I'll tell you yay or nay because there's not such a thing as a, you know, a universal rule that's just one thing. Like Nikon wow. lenses, like I said, it's one lens works. You know, if it's a Nikon mount, it works. This is uh -huh. like everything can work and everything can not work. Got it. And by the way, someone's right. written in, I don't know whether you've ever been burgled, but someone is claiming to have that specific Polaroid picture. Um, no, that, so um, if, yeah. you, if, you've, if you've lost that photo and you wonder where it is, uh, they've, they've yeah. confessed. <laughs> yeah, he's he's one of the ones that bid on the eBay uh, sale and got one. So he's a supporter of the channel <gasps> oh, and right. also a good friend. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for supporting Nico Great. That was brilliant. So yeah, I've switched back from the video now, but I think if people want to see more, I mean, that's um, we probably watched sort of half it there, and obviously we didn't have the audio on because we were, we were talking to you. But yeah, um, mm. I think that's a brilliant way. If, as, as if you're trying to picture what Nico's talking about, I mean, you saw him at the start. You saw him doing the tilt, you saw him trying the shift, you saw the focusing, and then you see yeah. very clearly the settings and the, the holder out before the, the shutter. So, no, that's yeah. brilliant. And then you, you do have quite a lot of other large format content on there that, that yeah. covers different mm -hmm. things. But yeah, it, usually um, most, mostly beginner stuff, but I want to do a bit more of breakdowns. So I will try to do a video where I do one picture and break down everything that happened and why I chose what I chose. So hopefully that will be coming soon. No, that's fine. And then also, um, maybe a bit linked to that, who would win in a fight, you or Matt Marash? I think Matt for sure. <laughs> I don't, I, he's got better hair. He's got a bigger <laughs> cameras. He oh. works at a camera store. He's been shooting longer than I do. Okay. Uh, so I think, I think he wins hands down, but I don't think Matt would ever fight me because he's just too, too much of a cool guy. So oh. I, I don't think. We would probably go out shooting more than fighting. And, well, uh, maybe maybe we do a Kickstarter and fund it fund it that way. But um, no, I mean that kind yeah. of thing I think would be fascinating. And hopefully, in a world where traveling becomes easier for a lot of us. Um, yeah, exactly. I had this summer. I was supposed to be traveling across the U.S. and I was going to be meeting with him and a couple other people. He doesn't know because I haven't told him. But I was supposed to be meeting with him <laughs> oh, and other oh, people. Now you know. But <laughs> yeah, now he knows. Hopefully, whenever this is over, if it ever is, uh, we'll be able to you know cross paths properly well he he has in fairness to him come back saying he thinks you've got the stamina so we'll see is oh. it a quick fight is it a knockout i don't know and but i think that is one thing that i think would be really interesting because immediately if you take two people out and say you know uh, you both have a 35 mil camera shoot this building or this person immediately there's a huge amount of choice there about lens and the film type and the lighting and the tone but if you said large format over landscape or something it just feels like the the options creatively um, to get a, a different photo become exponential. Yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, that's what I was saying. Like you don't shoot large format usually for the first time. Usually you, or you have it so into your body that you know. Mm. Um, so if you're not used to it, usually you've shot it in different formats or you've even seen the building or the person or the scene or whatever. Um, but if not, you also create an eye like I've shot so much four by five, like with a 90 mil with a travel wide 
that I never used the viewfinder. So I would just go around shooting and I knew what was going to be in and out of the frame. Like it becomes second oh. nature. So if you're using eight by 10 or four by five, you get used to the lenses and you know what's gonna be in or not, and you know what will cover and what can be done. And then you just shoot. And if you can't shoot it, well, you don't shoot it. I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> it's, you're not, nobody's gonna you know, lose their job because you didn't take a picture. So it's fine. Yeah. I'm conscious we've come to um, nine o'clock our time, 10 o'clock yours. So we'll wrap up the last few questions. Before, before we jump to Marina for her last ones, one that, that came in from, um, from, from a viewer, Tom Rayfield has asked, have you ever tried large format pinhole? Yeah, I shot it once with, a, I think it was a Walker camera with Ilford. They had a little kit. And honestly, <clears throat> I must have been terrible at composition because pinhole is pretty complicated, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. it become, I th sometimes the less you have, the harder it becomes. I shot like seven shots in, in color and I hated every single one of them. So oh. that camera has been gathering dust since. I do want to make my, you know, my my reconcile like reconcile with the format and well or the pinhole, but I want to do it in black and white, and I want to do maybe something like seascapes or something like which are always pretty gratifying. Yeah, because it must be hard to compose for a pinhole because you can't. If you look in the ground glass, they'll be just dark, right? Yeah, you can see a very little bit, but it's it's pretty darn hard. So yeah, it, it, I was too excited and I made too many mistakes in the sense that I shot I shot things. <laughs> thinking they would be in frame and they wouldn't, they, they weren't, and too much stuff. No, that's fine. So Marina, what are your last questions, thoughts? Uh... My last question is actually a question from a Benz from Hip Shoot Film, because I wanted to actually ask you anyway. So uh, can you recommend any widely regarded large format photographers to check out? Any, do you have an inspiration or any uh, um, like great photographers? This is a video I've been working on, but I haven't done yet, but large format, I like, there's a photographer from Chicago that called Marco Lorenzotti uh, or Lorenzetti. And uh, I made a video, maybe two, three videos ago about him uh, talking a little uh -huh. bit. And he's amazing. He's been shooting like the Chicago libraries, public libraries okay. on eight by 10. And his work is a, a stunning. And then he's done a lot of like photo composites where he shoots and then he makes like, I don't know, very cool stuff. So him, then one of my biggest inspirations too at the beginning was the new topographics. It's a whole exposition that I think uh, Kodak Rochester organized back in the day. And I'm saying like uh -huh. the 60s or the 70s. And in that one was Stephen Shore, Nicholas Nixon, um, and I want to say more, but I can't remember right now out off the top of my head, but th that whole book is amazing and the photographers are mm -hmm. all amazing. Um, but yeah, those are probably my favorite. In modern today, there's one called Ben Arwas or Arwas. He shot like Antonio Banderas on four by five black and white <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and I mean, in a good way, nice pictures and he does amazing work and he shoots like super eight and 16 mil and. Stuff hey. like that all the time. Yeah. Do you know anyone from Spain by any chance? I'm In just Spain curious. that I like, uh, Chema oh, Salvans, like? he shoots 4 by 5 but he uses a 6 by 7 back. And then okay. there's... Um, Tanit we don't, we don't have time for that. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Tanit Plana, who's a, a woman in Barcelona uh, that I really like. Planner. And okay. then there's Matt Marash in the US, I think, as well. <laughs> yeah, Matt Marash is a great photographer. He, does, he shoots different stuff than what I like, but I do like him and Matt his Marash. style sometimes. Yeah. I have to check you out, Matt. <laughs> I might, I'm letting you know, I might run out of battery. My camera's starting to blink. It's no, that's so fine. We, we, will, we will wrap it there. That's a perfect time. First of all, Nico, huge, huge thanks for coming to join us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Um, Guys, check out Nico Lacera on uh, Instagram, YouTube. We'll put the links below on this update overnight, but um, it's pretty easy to find. There is, I will guarantee you, you will find a video in there that is both interesting and entertaining for you, regardless of how, yep. what level you are, what format you're interested in. Hugely, hugely, definitely somebody to subscribe. Marina, as always, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Before we go, thank you Marina, so much. can you please show off your latest tattoo? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Got this one. Oh my gosh. The <laughs> If We Film logo. And, and also, who. The If We Film logo. Which professional tattoo artist did that? And how long have they been in training before they did it? So, my partner, and uh, he got into tattooing a month ago. So, yeah. And he's been great. So, <laughs> so final question for everyone to just sort of go away and consider Would you allow your partner 
to buy a tattoo gun and a month later um, tattoo your arm. Uh, I'm amazed, Marina, that the, the faith is... I did it twice, so... Twice, wow. Okay, that's amazing. No, seriously, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for watching. It will thank be Rick guys. and Marina next week with an exciting topic yet to be decided. So if you have any suggestions, let us know. Um, thank you so much, guys. We will we'll head off now. Have a great weekend. Happy shooting. Happy bank holiday. And see you next Thursday. See Bye. you guys.